Check, check, check. Hello, how we doing? Everybody going okay. All right, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys podcast. I am Big Z. And I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And we are actually recording remote today. We are sheltering in place because Washington State just got shut down. We can't uh, go out and do things anymore. We were promised zombies and we got a virus instead. I did see a fun meme, though, that uh, they had the guys at Costco all swarm in the pallet of, uh, of uh, toilet paper and then they had the zombie noises overlaid from the, the Walking Dead or whatever. <laughs> It was pretty hilarious. My, my favorite was, uh, it was basically, we were promised Mad Max, but we got the big Lebowski. So. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, today we are kicking off a second episode of uh, Getting to Know, and we have a special guest, again, sheltering in place from California. Uh, this gentleman has uh, started a company uh, a number of years ago in the off-road community. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's been on Shark Tank on ABC. He's a current, uh, um, I think he's no longer technically a firefighter. He's an engineer, but he has firefighting and EMT background. Uh, he has invented the only hard shell CVT belt uh, in case and enclosure for the off-road industry. Uh, we just recently put out a review of that product. Um, he is the owner and founder of Savage UTV. Uh, welcome, Matthew Sar- Scarposi. Is it Scarposi? Scarpuzzi? Scarpuzzi. It's a tough one. Oh, man. <laughs> it's one of those names where you just don't want to mess it up. I know. I know. Imagine having that across your shoulder pads in high school football. It was pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> so you played, you played football, huh? Yeah, a little bit. Not enough to be good at it. Oh, well, Matt, uh, welcome to the show. Um, you are, like I said, the, the founder and owner of Savage UTV. Um, how have you been down in California? You're, out, you're based out of where? We are in Alpine, which is kind of the east side of San Diego County. Um, and obviously being in California, I, I believe we were the first state to do the statewide lockdown. Um, you know, we, we've got Sacramento, L.A., San Diego, um, San Francisco, you know, it's a it's a lot of populated areas, so I think they're pretty quick to try and get everybody isolated, and um, you know I I understand what they're trying to do there. So we've been under lockdown for a little bit here. Yeah. So uh, on this episode, uh, Ian is uh, st- recording from his home. I'm recording from the studio in my home, and you're at your home in Southern California. Um, so uh, Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself. We're going to get into the business side of things uh, about how you started, uh, how the product came to be, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but kind of just give us some background on on yourself and maybe a little bit about your your family and, and where you grew up and all that. Yeah, I've been in uh, San Diego pretty much all my life. Um, I have a wife and two kids and uh, started uh, working in the fire department about 13 years ago um, and always had kind of ideas. You know, I think as a firefighter, your job is really to be a problem solver um, for all the different calls that we go on, uh, you know, 911 responses. We have to solve some of the craziest, weirdest things you can imagine. And so I think I always had that creative kind of mindset. Um, and in about 2010, uh, came up with a product idea uh, like you said, was able to go on Shark Tank um, with that product and then really ran that company for a few years and then made a made a call to kind of, I wanted to get into my passion, my my whole family. We love camping. We love off-roading. So I wanted to do something that was more around my passion. So transferred that, uh, that business um, and that entrepreneurial creativity into something that I wanted to, uh, you know, fit my family and my whole lifestyle. So I was able to do that in uh 2018 i think about two years ago now some of your first posts on social media i believe were in june 2018 uh i went back kind of just looking through you know some history there to see you know what was the what was there see if i could find any dirt on you but uh yeah. the uh the the first posts were of some examples of some belts in the wild that were zip tied to roll cages and things like that um and uh and so uh in 2018, what kind of spurred you to start this business? How did that come to be? Um, was it based out of a product idea? Was it about just starting a business and finding a product to make? Was it, um, how did Savage UTV come about? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I got stuck in the Mexican desert. That's pretty much, uh, summing it up. <laughs> I was racing, uh, in the San Felipe 250, 
Uh, we had a belt failure pretty early on in the race uh, with a brand new belt. Um, so we had pulled over, we had changed the belt. And shortly after that, we had our second failure. Um, we changed that belt. And shortly after that, we had a third failure. Um, the belts that we had put on the vehicle were, were brand new. Um, and as we were kind of stuck out, we ended up not finishing that race, um, which we did have some clutch issues, which is kind of what was causing those belt failures. But I sat out there going, man, these belts are brand new. And one of them was zip tied up on the roll cage, like everybody you know, was doing at that time out in the sun, the UV rays, who knows? I don't even know how long it had been on that car. And then our other belt was in a main tool bag that had wrenches, pliers, you know, everything in there and every single vibration and bounce that we took and hit in that car, you know, those things were rubbing. And I was like, man, there's gotta be a better way. This is the backbone of this car. And we are stuck here now, you know, <laughs> not able to move because this giant rubber band, you know, snapped. Um, and so I'm coming from a fire background all of our medical equipment, any tactical kind of gear that we carry is always in a Pelican style case. And so I started looking around to buy one. Um, and when I didn't find it, I went, wow, maybe maybe there's other people that would would like to keep their belt change, uh, you know, mounted up on the cage and just started designing, you know, took took that background of engineering and started drawing out drawings and, and came up with what is today the, the Savage UTV case. So so you came up with this idea for the product. Well, first of all, let's get back to the race. So you've been in racing? So I raced, uh, I've always been a part of racing from a support um, angle. Uh, I was a medic uh, on a helicopter with Mastercraft, got about 10 years ago, flying over um, Robbie Pierce and Rob McCachron were the two drivers back then. So working as a medic and then also being doing pit crews and chasing, but could never afford to actually get in you know, to a race car. Um, in 2017, we had the opportunity to build a car and race in the Baja 500 and not having a single day in a race car seat. I said, let's do it. And that was our first race that we ever did. And uh, we finished fourth in a pro UTV, which was kind of cool because everybody was telling us, you know, it's your first race. You haven't even done like a local district race. You're going to do the Baja 500, do the sportsman class, just kind of, you know, see. And I was like, I want, I want to go for it, you know? And some of my buddies that we were racing with said, you got to race the pro class. Why might as well, you know, see how you do. And we were honestly racing to finish, um, trying to be conservative. Uh, we were doing a fundraiser for a local boy, uh, with cerebral palsy and our whole race team was called racing for Mason to raise money for his treatment. And so the idea of just finishing the race for this boy uh, was all that was on my mind. I was in the car for 19 hours and 50 minutes and we finished fourth. Uh, it was an awesome experience and it really hooked me into racing. So the next race that we did was uh, the San Felipe 250 and that was where we had broke all the belts. Uh, and that was at that point, that was my racing career. So were you racing the pro class again in that uh, San Felipe? We did. It was the same car. Um, we raced the pro class. We were first off the line. Um, we had picked off about seven uh, turbo cars just leaving town in that first maybe 10 mile stretch. Had a really good race going. The car, we had redone all the suspension. The car was working great. And we just had a rock punch through our skid plate and hit our drive line. Um, kind of an unfortunate uh, spot. Um, we did some repairs, got back going again, and then we continued with the clutch issues and that ultimately took us out of the race. When you're in the middle of the desert, uh, is the first thing that goes through your mind how to fix the car or is it how do I not get shot? <laughs> it's always the car. Uh, I, I go into race mode um, and I've been down in Mexico so long that it's, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable down there. We've had minor issues, but but nothing that really worries me. And it's kind of like, I guess I can relate it to when I'm on a fire engine my mind is, you know, about my job and there are a lot of distractions around, but you tunnel those out to focus on what has to be done. When I was driving, um, I wanted that car to get going again. And for all the sponsors that, that support you for the families that take time off to come down and help, you want to get that car going again. And, and that was what, uh, was the really the main thing on my mind. Um, obviously the idea for the product came afterwards as I sat and kind of reflected on that, but out there, I just I just wanted to get going again. Right. 
when you when you were kind of debriefing yourself on this and you're trying to figure out this product or the solution, I should, should say, uh, you know, what kind of led you towards, you know, making a product and into an, and thus a company versus just building your own solution? I think um, so. My my last company, we had done some injection molding. And it's it's tough. You know, if you're going to machine something, you can make one, you can make 10. If you're going to make something that's injection molded, um, the molds are so expensive that you got to make thousands and thousands and thousands to even recover that cost. And when I first started the, the product idea, I thought, man, you know, is there even enough people that would like this for me to even go down that that route? Um, and we 3D printed one and we prototyped it um, to, to kind of do a proof of concept and make sure that it fit on the vehicles and it, and it was what we were looking for. But I literally came to a, a fork in the road and I said, I either have to do this and it's going to be an entire company. It's going to, you know, we're going for it or I need to stop now and just have this prototype for myself. And I really reached out to my friends in, in the UTV community racing uh, and, and recreationally and said, what are your thoughts? And got a got a good response back, and I said, you know what, man, this is this is it's business, it's a gamble, but I did my homework. The product is well made, and I think this is going to work. And uh, you know, talked to my wife and said, hey, this is a big commitment, and what do you think? And she said, you got to do it. And uh, so we went into production. So when you're looking at a product like this, uh, kind of describe. Well, first of all, let's describe kind of what the product is. Why don't you give us the overview of what that product looks like? Absolutely. We, uh, the other cool thing is we make these totally hundred percent in the U S um, in San Diego County here, we have a great injection molding company. We contract with him and it is made out of a black ABS. Um, we do add a little bit of a UV protectant that's injected into the mold. And the reason for that is obviously a lot of places are, are out in the desert. It's hot, it's sunny. Uh, those UV rays can really beat up the plastics on your car. So we wanted this to be sitting out in vehicles that, you know, are outdoors for years. Uh, and to be able to not crack or dry out or fail. Um, so we, we we did that. And then the other hard part was I really wanted screws and nuts and bolts and all the other little pieces to come from the U.S. too. Um, so we started going down that route of finding foam and all the other hardware and things to build the case that are locally sourced here within the States. So uh, the Savage UTV belt kit is a... Uh like you said, a uh, black ABS plastic shell in a Pelican style case. Um, I just held it up for, for the viewers that are watching on YouTube. Um, and uh, it's a the shell case that's a highly durable, highly flexible plastic that's not going to take, um, you know, take to cracking and, you know, splintering, things like that, that you'd normally associate with cheap plastic. It's, it's a higher end ABS plastic that's cooled in a certain way to give it certain elasticity, things like that. Um, and then you have an actual gasket around the inside of that lid. Uh, you have an air vent at the top. You have um, a couple different configuration options that you can uh, speak to here in a second. But basically, if you've ever seen like a high-end camera case or a high-end um, uh, electrical sensitive equipment type case, it's always in this like molded shell form. Um, and the reason is because of the high impact resistance, the high um, insulation from the outside. You have the customizable foam on the inside to give you the configuration options you need for that specific product. So it's not flopping around. Um, and so when you were kind of coming into this realm of you you have this history in the firefighting world, you have the history of touching um, all these different cases that you normally associate with sensitive equipment or durability issues. Um, what was the thought process of transforming uh, an idea to uh, fruition when it comes to designing this product? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, the, the motto to our company says it all is protect your ride. And, and we really wanted to make a product that would allow people to know that their belt is being stored in a way that they don't have to worry about whether that muddy puddle is going to get water up on uh, the belt. You know, if the UV rays or the vibrations, all of that stuff should be out of their mind. It's in foam, it's protected. Um, and so that protect your ride was really what we wanted to, to, to design the case around. Um, and in fact, one of the biggest questions we had in the beginning was, hey, that bends your belt, keeping it in that case. You know, that's a pretty severe bend. Um, and, and I understand that there's a lot of people zip tying them with a similar kind of bend. And I always looked at it like, I wonder if that's uh, damaging, you know, the strands and, and all of the, uh, the parts of the belt on the end there. I am not a CBT engineer. So 
what did I do? I reached out to Polaris. I reached out to Can-Am. I spoke with their CVT engineers and I said, hey, you know, I'm designing this product. It does bend that. What is my limitation? What What is going to hurt the belt? What is not? And we really worked with them to find uh, a, a way that we could not make this thing so big that you wouldn't be able to mount it on your cage, but not do any damage to the belt. Um, and so that was kind of the most important thing was to just, again, stick along the lines of protect your right, have these belts, have your tools, have this ready to go so that you can get home. I didn't want people stranded in the middle of the desert like I was. Um, I wanted you to be able to rely on that spare part to get you back to camp, get you back home or get you to the finish of the race. Let's speak a little bit about why you want to protect your belt. Um, you know, a lot of people are, it, it's just a belt. I'll throw it in the back of the seat or in a little cubby or in the glove box, whatever. What are kind of the, some of those, uh, reasons you want to protect the belt? Yeah. And, and I get, uh, a lot of people come from different budgets. They come from different riding terrains and, and different vehicle performance. And so, you know, maybe our product isn't for everybody. It is, I feel it is a higher end product for people that really take care of their, their, their rides. And they want to maybe go long distances and be able to trust that it's going to be okay. Um, uh, that, that it's going to perform when they need it. The funny thing is if you open, so, so the, that two seat race car that I was racing was a 2016 natural aspirated Polaris. If you open the owner's manual to that vehicle, there are two paragraphs that talk about your centrifugal clutch or your CVT system. It is mentioned eight times in the two paragraphs. Keep your belt and clutch clean and clear of debris. To me, that was a no-brainer. Um, you're running seven, 8,000 RPM, 150 to 200 degrees. There is an immense amount of heat, friction, and force being put onto that entire system, the belt and the clutch. You introducing moisture, sand, mud, dirt, debris is going to create even more friction, even more debris. You're going to wear down the sheaths of the clutch. You're going to uh, ultimately come up with a failure of the belt. So we really wanted to keep that area clean and clear of debris like the manufacturer stated. And to me, that started with making sure that your belt that you put in there is clean. You're using PPE for the actual case. And I was wondering what inspired that. And the reason it stuck out to me is that's what full throttle uses for the cases on its batteries. I mean, obviously it's very, it's a, uh, you know, it's fire retardant to a degree, you know, I, I the UL, a UL rating on it was a UL night. I can't remember what it is, but, uh, yeah, we've, we've had our batteries exposed to constant temperatures, uh, in fires, basically to tell you, make a long story short, we had a fire engine that basically got engulfed in flame in Montana and our batteries were subjected to fire for roughly about somewhere in around 15 minutes. They didn't fail. They didn't warp anything like that. Is that kind of the motivation for using that? Yeah, it, it's funny you bring that up. Um, we had a racer. Um, actually, you probably would recall he's the young man that uh, jumped the canal just recently. Um, uh, Ruslan. Uh, yeah, Ruslan. And, and uh, yeah, he, he's a full throttle kid. <laughs> yeah, he uh, he's a fun kid to uh, to hang around and kids full of energy. Yeah. Um, but he he has been running our cases uh, for a while. In fact, he had a case on that car when he went over the canal. And uh, he came to my house uh, the day that he had done that video before it was even out on the internet and kind of told me what he had done and everything. And there is a video I gave him a first aid kit because I was like, oh, man, you know, there, there's both sides of that story, obviously. But uh, I said, man, I want to make sure that you do not get hurt. And we had just come out with the first aid kit. Um, and so I said, here, take this, put this on your car, please. His dad mounted it right next to the exhaust. I mean, literally up against the exhaust and sent me a photo. And I, and I said, whoa, hey, uh, you know, we, the, these, uh, we've had a couple of race cars that caught fire with the case on it and the case withstood the flames, but who knows how long. And, you know, it's hard to tell what the rating is on that. But right next to an exhaust, I, I said, wow, I, I really would recommend finding somewhere else. And he said, man, we've already had this thing on here for months and it's fine. And uh, I got a chance to go look at the case at the Mint 400 uh, just a few weeks ago. And I went up to it and popped the buckles and looked inside. And it, it was just a few inches off of both of those exhaust pipes. And I couldn't believe how well it was taking a beating from that heat. Uh, it was impressive. But yeah, we really, that's the idea is anything that is going to affect that belt, heat, UV, moisture, we really want that sealed layer to keep all that stuff out. Um, so that that belt is ready to go when you need it. 
Yeah, PPE, PPE is very common in batteries. You know, the other thing that you'll see every now and then is like a polycarbonate, and the polycarbonate tends to be a little bit more rigid, whereas over time it seems to get a little frail, a little fragile, and you drop it, it almost like explodes or something, whereas the PPE seems to have a little bit of uh, resilience, a little bit of flex to it. So, yeah, that's I was super interested in why we were using that material. Yeah, and we, we did a great amount of, of research. It is funny, whenever we put new products out, the public goes, well, have you tried it on this? Well, have you, like our CV puller, uh, we, la- we launched a video at the Mint and had 300,000 views that weekend. And I got every question of, well, have you tried it on a real vehicle? And it's amazing how people fail to see that when your entire company is, is putting a product out, you really do put a lot of effort into researching materials, researching how it's being manufactured, what the assembly process is. You know, you really want that product, if you're doing it right, to be something that the customer is gonna be very happy with and and rely on no matter what environment they're in or what kind of, uh, you know, trauma and vibrations and crazy things they expose it to. So that's kind of the the angle we took was try and find something that's gonna last long, be dependable. And to be clear, you don't want to, uh, like you said, mounting it next to the exhaust. You still don't want to do that. Um, you're still introducing unnecessary uh, circumstances to the product, uh, and eventually heat will overcome plastic at, at some point. So, um, so I just wanted to make it, make sure we were being clear that you're not recommending to mount your uh, Savage UTV cases next to your exhaust. It's not the intended purpose, but um, but it's just a testament to um, the the engineering and the testing that went into it. Absolutely. We, we don't recommend hooking it to a tree branch either, but I, I, a few people have uh, tried. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we've got, I've got videos of my son driving a bobcat over him. I mean, we really wanted to, just like you guys, we really wanted to push this thing and see how far these cases will go. And yeah, we don't recommend that you do that to your case, but we also want to know that, that it, it is going to be something you can rely on. It's funny. I saw the video of you dragging it behind the uh, the side by side out in the desert uh, not too long ago. And uh, when we were out testing it, we we're like, "Hey, we should hook us to a chain or to a rope or something, and, and just drag it through the whoops and and all that." And then after we were doing the torture with it running it over and and twisting on it and all that, it's like that's not going to be any worse than what we just did. I mean, that, that's yeah. pretty much the ultimate torture you could do to that thing. So, um, yeah. you know, pretty impressed. If you haven't seen uh, the review, uh, we have a written form on our website with a lot of detail. Um, if you're into reading and looking at pictures and we have it on our YouTube page uh, with a lot of uh, fun clips and things like that. So if you haven't checked it out, check uh, our YouTube page out and you'll see uh, the review of that case. Um, so speaking of reviews, um, you've had this product out into the market for uh, about a year and a half, almost two years now. Um, and with any good company, they want to keep improving and getting things uh, moving forward in a positive direction, um, not just standing still and, and becoming stale. So what kind of um, testing in the marketplace, what kind of feedback have you gotten from some of your sponsored riders, um, people that actually have the product out besides just us? We Our review is, is out there for people to go watch. So, But as far as the racers and the other people that you've had uh, put this product to uh, through its paces, what kind of feedback do you have and how did you respond to that? Yeah, honestly, we've really only gotten two um, consistent repetitive feedbacks, and you guys in your review nailed uh, nailed one of them. The the latches we designed to hold a very tight um, closure on it, and um, a good amount of people have come back and said, "Hey, this is this is great, but man, it hurts. It it's too much." Um, so we went back to the drawing board um, with the engineer that designed all the CAD files for the case and everything. And we 3D printed just a bunch of different latches, trying different fittings. And literally, they were all within two one hundredths of an inch. That's how precise these changes are that were being made. But but we do want to hold that tight seal, you know, but we don't want our customers breaking a knuckle. So we've actually redesigned the latches. Our mold is going to get remachined and production moving forward will have all those new latches on it. That being said, our entire inventory that we have today that is not yet assembled is being remachined to have those better latches. And we are going to move forward on making a kit so that for those customers that already at home have one of our older cases, they can retrofit it with our new latches. That was a big part of the design was we didn't wanna change anything too drastically that those customers would be left out. The other feedback that we got was that it's pricey, it's expensive. Um, you know, And we see things like, oh, it's a plastic box, it should be $10. Um, we do make all of our parts here in the U.S. 
Um, and that comes at a little bit of a cost. And we also do make sure that these products going out are good, which means the ones that are made and are not good are, are thrown away. So to ensure a high grade product that is made here in the States, um, it is expensive and it does come at a cost. So, you know, if we start manufacturing more of these, we will be able to drop the cost. And in fact, we are doing that with our first aid kit because that started out kind of small. And now, you know, if you think about it, a, a Honda Talon doesn't have a, a belt drive system, but they sure as heck could use a first aid kit. So we're seeing growth in the sales of our first aid kit. And if I wanted to be that business owner that just pockets all of that profit, you know, I could do that. But um, I want people to be able to afford the products. And if I can bring that price down, but still keep my business operating, I will do that. So we are looking at dropping that first aid kit price so that it is a little bit more um, of an easier price to swallow if you're out there shopping for first aid kits. And a lot of that is in, in bulk purchasing, uh, not just the manufacturing of the case itself, but just the components that are going into it. So when you speak about that first aid kit, you're talking about the red bag, that the zip bag that it comes in that inside the case, and that you're talking about all the supplies that go into that case, because uh, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, you're not overseas in China with 100 child workers doing this for you. You know, there's a lot of personal investment of time and, and assembly that goes into this. Um, and so when you're talking about the resources involved in counting out that many swabs, counting out that many, you know, bandages or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, that's when you're, when you're a small business and, and I don't want to say you're small by any means, but, um, but when you're a small business and not at a global scale, you're not having machines made that do this for you. They're not doing auto sort and auto pack and all this other stuff. There's actually time involved. And as we all know, as Americans, time is very expensive and probably the most precious commodity we have. So, um, when, I, I don't think there's enough emphasis on the fact that this is entirely uh, made in the United States. There is uh, a lot of talk in the community about supporting small business, the mom and pop shops. Um, if you can buy American, buy American. We're, we're proud Americans, etc. cetera. Uh, but when it comes down to it, there's a whole lot of us buying Chinese light bars off eBay, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, I, I understand too, that everybody has a budget. Um, I've made sure that all of our social media, that everything that my company puts out, we never bash or talk negative about someone who is putting their, their belt in a Ziploc bag and putting it under their seat. Um, if, if that is your way, I, I fully support you making an effort to protect that belt from the environment. They're doing the same thing that I'm doing. And, and I'm not going to sit here and tell them that, Oh, you know, that's not right. Uh, in fact, if you can't afford our cases, a Ziploc bag is a great way to do that. Now, there's all kinds of other things that, you know, it's not going to offer the same level of protection. Um, but 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 I know everybody comes from a different budget and background. And uh, if you're lucky enough to, to be able to have an off-road vehicle, um, you know, you, you, you're you already ahead of the game. You're in a great place. If you can put some great products on that, all the better to you. And we'd love to offer those products to our customers. Right. And like uh, we have a Polaris Razor uh, 2016 Turbo. Uh, and for the longest time, the belt was uh, in the cubby in the body panel right behind the seat. Uh, and it, you think about it in your it just in the quick thought that you're doing it. It's out of the way. It's not it's not exposed. Uh, but in reality, it is right. There's there's still dust and grass. There's still water. There's still mud. Uh, when you're pressure washing it, you're putting your belt to. If you're not taking the time to take it out, you're taking it to that uh, high pressure uh, of the jet. Uh, so there's there's a lot of things that just naturally occur to wear and wear at the belt. Um, and so it's it's if like you've said before in some of your posts, if you're going to spend two hundred dollars on a belt or two belts to be your backup for when you're out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's worth your investment to protect that um, that critical piece of infrastructure. If you can't move your machine, you're not getting home. So uh, I, it seems to me kind of just like a jack or a spare tire uh, or a first aid kit. There's a lot of these things that we have to take into consideration when we're going out on our, our adventures in these machines. And uh, if you're going deep in the woods like I like to do, um, you know, we can we can jump on the machine and disappear for three three or four hours into the back country, not realize it. And then all of a sudden we were a hundred miles away from loadout and we blow a belt. Right. So, um, 
it doesn't seem worth the risk versus the reward of saving that money to me personally. Um, yeah. But I've been there. I've been, you know, the belt in the glove box. I've been the belt uh, behind the seat. Uh, I've been with people that are just, you know, I, I got this machine secondhand from some my family and we really like it, but we just can't afford the investment into a custom cage or bigger wheels. We just want to enjoy the sport. Right. And yeah. um, and so there's there's definitely a place and a purpose for every product. There's a there's a niche for everything. And um, if you can afford the extra money to protect your investment, it's worth every penny. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm with you. I like to go out in the middle of nowhere, uh, but I also like to come back. <laughs> and and uh, there's a lot of, you know, again, talking about materials and engineering and building. Um, most people don't understand that, that the compounds, the rubber compounds that are being used for the majority of these belts. Um, you know, if you put that under a microscope, you'd be amazed at how close that resembles like human skin. Um, it's very porous. Um, most of these rubber compounds are actually a natural fiber. And they will absorb just like our skin. You know, you don't want chemicals on your skin. They will absorb their environment, whether that is oil, moisture, dust, dirt. And if you think about it, the side of that belt is what's being compressed against the sheaves of the clutch. That that exposed area, as it gets impregnated with oil, grease, or sand, um, that rubs against those sheaves. And everybody's seen the pictures online of the sheave that just like literally separates in the middle. And they're like, how did this happen? It literally cut through aluminum. Right. Well, that's that your rubber belt has some kind of debris in there that is creating a sandpaper type of effect every time it goes around. And yeah, it'll eat right through an aluminum, you know, object. Uh, so we, we, we try and minimize that. Um, and yeah, if it's a, if it's a Ziploc bag, because uh, that works for you, that's better than nothing. Um, but if you want the best, the best, we want to pri- provide that for you. Uh, so to keep things moving, uh, talking about the first aid kit a little bit, um, you know, where where did the inspiration come from that? I, I have a feeling that I know the answer to this, but uh, where where did you come up with that idea and how did you implement that? So, so as we started selling the cases and selling the toolkits, um, we started brainstorming. What else do people want to take with them or what else do people currently take with them that they want protected? And it was actually my wife uh, that said, first aid kit, you have one on all your cars, but it's always getting wet when you pressure wash the car when we come back or it's getting moved or, you know, uh, and then we don't know where it's at. How nice would it be if that was out of the elements and it was not moved, it's mounted on your cage. And I said, wow, that's a great idea. And uh, yeah, with my medical background working as a medic, I, I didn't realize how many first aid kits out there are like 65 band-aids and 20 <laughs> hand wipes. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's, it's kind of your, um, entry level first aid kit. Um, and then you get into some other products. Um, we're, we're buddies with the guys from one life trauma. They make an exceptional, um, race inspired, I would say, um, kit that has like emergency water. It has quick plot. It is kind of like, more of a almost like a combat inspired um, uh, kit. Now it's it's bigger, um, but it's an awesome awesome product. We wanted to kind of land somewhere in the middle. We wanted something that would have a tourniquet. It would have a couple sets of gloves, some good uh, bandaging for for any kind of like torso bleeding or something major like that. An emergency blanket, um, even some steri strips and laceration type of stuff. You know the traumatic injuries that I saw. Uh, out in the field, you know, from whether it's dirt bikes, quads, uh, or side by sides, we wanted you to be able to handle that. Um, we included trauma shears. I mean, part of this is some people don't realize if if you are in a harness system and your vehicle's upside down, sometimes you do need to cut someone out, whether it's cutting the seat belts or even just cutting their jeans to expose an injury. Um, so we included those trauma shears uh, in the kits, and and it landed us somewhere right in the middle of of, you know, we have a lot of race cars that are running these on there and they have what they need to be able to handle injuries. But we do have a lot of weekend warriors that do go up into the hills, out into the desert, out into the mud. And they know, God forbid, they ever have to touch it. But they know peace of mind, it's there and it's not being moved. I mean, we've seen pictures of our customers that have them locked shut with a lock on it um, because they know that stuff can walk away and we want to make sure that it's there. You just touched on the uh, the waterproof element of it, and that's something I'm sure most people don't even take into a factor. I mean, like over my left shoulder here, right over there, is uh, my first aid kit. And the second that thing gets hit by a pressure washer, I'm sure it's smoked. <laughs> so. Yeah, and, and we've had in our race cars, you know, we, we 
cross rivers, we hit puddles. And then even if we don't do that, even if it's a dry desert race, the first thing we do when we get home is we pressure wash every inch of that thing. So I was seeing the old first aid kits that I had penetrated by that moisture and all the gauze pads ruined, the band-aids ruined, you know, all of that stuff. Just uh, who wants mold growing in your shoulder bandage, you know, and that kind of stuff. So again, and who, wants, and who wants to take a half an hour to take gear off their car to uh, just to wash the thing. So, <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah. Another thing that is super important is just accessibility to, uh, the emergency supplies, right? So a lot of us, uh, we, we pack things away so that they're out of the way. They're not something on top of our mind if they're going to fall off or whatever. We, we put things behind the seat, under the seat, tie it down in a toolbox in the back, under a spare tire, under a cooler. Like we put things away and hide them because we don't think we're ever going to need them. But when it comes to safety, right? Like that's when you need quick access to that product. So, um, yeah. there was, uh, it brings up a, an, a, an experience that I had, uh, uh, about a year ago or so, um, we had a friend that was actually out snowmobiling, um, and they were out just doing some product testing and for, uh, the circumstances that they ended up being in, he went over the, the hill with the machine, his leg got sucked up into the tunnel of the machine. Um, and the paddles of that, uh, track system basically, uh, whacked away at his flesh until it got down to the bone. Um, and his boot ended up clogging it blowing the belt and that's what saved his uh probably saved his life but uh the quick actions of the people that were with it, with him that had the resources to treat the wound in the back country are what saved his life from him bleeding out from him becoming a, a, statistic, a statistic statistic sorry um and in the off-road world like we we recently had a podcast about avalanche safety there's a lot more guys with um these rigs that have tracks on them and they're going deeper into the back country that you wouldn't normally even think about, uh, during the winter uh, months. And, you know, we all think about spare belts and we think about hydration and food and whatever. We don't really think about the avalanche that could possibly be triggered by our machine and the trapped, uh, situation that we could be at the bottom of that avalanche, things like that. So when we talk about safety, you know, medical uh, treatment is a huge one and knowing how to use it and knowing what you have and what you don't have. Um, and when you need radio for help, all those things come into play. Um, I've thought about uh, having a dedicated podcast just to that topic. How do you take care of yourself in the back country um, when something does happen, right? Whether that be in the desert, whether that be in the mountains, uh, things can happen. You can roll, you can put your arm out the window. Um, I've heard stories of people amputating their limbs, um, things like that. And and so it, it could be a, something as simple as just getting impaled by a branch, right? Like you could just fall out of the machine or stumble and, and get impaled. Um, you can get a, a, a branch through the firewall like I did a, a year or so ago. Um, yep. and came very close to taking out my uh, shins, if not my rib cage. So, and that was like a four inch branch. So you can imagine what kind of impact that would have done. Uh, and so the first aid kit is a huge, huge deal. You, and like you said, you go to Walmart, a lot of, uh, a lot of us just go to Walmart. What's the biggest first aid kit that I can fit in my machine. Okay. That one, it has 1300 yeah. pieces, right? Um, yeah. what you don't know is that you have 1300 variations of sizes of band-aids, and right. not uh, actual yeah. trauma uh, items that help you actually survive. So one of the first things I looked at with your medical kit was, uh, is there a tourniquet in there? A lot of us, you know, we're, we're riding in a comfort sense. We're not taking things like a lot of guys don't wear like waist belts and things like that because it's not comfortable for a long period of time sitting. Uh, things like that. And, and so you don't think about how would I have a tourniquet, right? So seeing a tourniquet in there and seeing scissors, like in, a, in an emergency situation, when your hands are shaky, you don't want a pocket knife trying to cut somebody's clothing off. Uh, right. You know, trauma shears are, are what you really actually want. Um, and so I'm, I'm really happy to see how that kit's been developed. Um, and and so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just excited to see that product in the market. You, you bring up a great point, um, you know, with with going out into the snow you have the equipment you have the tracks but do you have the knowledge of what what you're doing yep. um and and we we took that same approach with the first aid kit what are we doing to the customers when when they buy this first aid kit they have the equipment um that's only half the picture what what is the other half that's missing they need the knowledge so our tourniquets come with a full instruction sheet demonstrating how to use it and we include an entire first aid guide everything from minor cut bandaging burn treatment it's all in there we wanted to give the customers 
yes, the scissors and the tourniquets and the gauze pads, but we also wanted to give them that information so that they can go, I have the equipment, but now I also have uh, the faith that I, that I understand how to use it. And we are, my family, my friends or myself is good to go out into the middle of nowhere and be prepared. It just, it's, it's a great testament to somebody that has the knowledge identifying the problem and fulfilling the need, the, the solution to the problem. Um, I think that's just a, a great product. So, Thanks. um, talking about, uh, variations and new products, uh, you have a product coming out in conjunction with another brand. Yes. Uh, so we work with a lot of other companies that are in Southern California here. We're lucky enough to be close with a lot of off-road, um, um, companies. And one of those companies is pro Eagle. Uh, they make some incredible jacks. We've used them, um, for pre-running and racing. And they recently released a CO2 powered jack that I feel is, is pretty well um, fit for the UTV industry just because it is compact. Um, it has a, some limitations with its lifting, which on larger vehicles may, may not work so well, but for the UTVs, it's, it's beautiful. It's perfect. Um, so they, we had been talking with them about their jacks. They kind of were wanting a, a storage solution. And uh, I talked to their owner and said, hey, can I just have one to kind of play around with and see, you know, our cases are only about 24 inches long. How do you fit an entire jack system in this? Right. Um, and it was a bit challenging, but um, we ended up just kind of redesigning the base plate to that jack so that it could be removable and then just created a custom foam so that, again, we're supporting the, this expensive, well-made product is now taken care of. It's protected. It's in foam. It has everything you need. It's reliable. You'll know it's there. Um, and it's again, mounted right where you put it on the cage. Um, it, it's not going to move around. You're not wondering if you took it off and put it back. Um, and we were able to come up with a solution to store not only just the jack, but the hose and the control valve, the compressed air cylinders and all the spares, you know, say you get that thing up and all of a sudden you realize you're in a bad spot. You bring it down and you exhaust the, the air that's in one of those cylinders. Maybe keeping a couple cylinders is a good idea and having our case allows you to store multiple. So it's been a great solution. Um, and we're literally probably within the next week or so that product will be out uh, to the public with just the case uh, for those customers that have already ordered the jack. Our hope is to provide the entire product jack and case available on our website so that future purchasers can, can have everything all in one spot. Um, to be able to mount that up on their car. Yeah, and it's uh, it has a lot of how do I say this? The the it has a lot to do with the same idea of protecting your investment. The the jack itself is a great solution for anybody that just needs to be able to quickly pump it up, drop it, and get going again. Uh, but it's also not a cheap jack, right? It's not just a scissor jack that you bought at AutoZone. And so uh, leaving it out in the elements, those being an air jack, it has seals. It has you know a, a, a piston that you need to keep in good shape. You have hoses that you don't want ingress of dust and dirt and mud and all that stuff. You don't want to have a, a pebble in your air canister uh, outlet. Things like that come into play. Um, and so a solution where you can contain it is, is a, a great option, especially when you can lock it down and know that it's not going to get stolen while you're um, at the co at the, the local pub in your city that has street legal UTV. So um, I, I really think that's a great solution and yet uh, just another a way that a great product can evolve over time to do other things. Um, yeah. So uh, speaking of evolutions, uh, there are some products that have uh, you've kind of put to market, but then said, you know, this is not a great solution. And then you have redirections, almost completely total pivots from uh, enclosures to tools, right? So can you kind of explain maybe how some of that's uh, worked through your business? Yeah. So last June, I had the opportunity to go down to Mexico on a, on a group ride. I think we had about 22 cars um, that was everybody from, you know, Joe Schmo Weekend Warrior um, to a couple of the top uh, UTV pro UTV racers in the nation. Um, it was a great ride, such a fun time. Um, and in that I was able to work with a couple of these people that had failures of their machine during the four or five days that we were down there. One of the things that I noticed was that a lot of people were carrying spare axles and didn't really have a good solution for that. Um, so we had come up with basically a, a cage mounted axle tube um, that, that we could manufacture for customers that wanted to be able to have that spare axle easily accessible up on their cage. Coming back 
it was a great idea, but I think a lot of people that are into their machines enough that they are carrying spare axles and things like that um, probably have come up with a good solution on their own or are able to build something. So the, the product really didn't go anywhere. We sold a few of them and decided after that point to just kind of focus our energy on something else. Um, but on that same trip, we did have someone break an axle actually a few times and we were stuck on the beach. Uh, the second time was about an hour and a half trying to get this CV out of the rear diff. Uh, it was a Polaris. And I was sitting there watching and the two individuals that were working on the car are professional racers, really well-respected guys. And they had all the best equipment. I think there was one or two impact drivers down there, a whole spread of tools. And this thing was kicking our butts. It was all of us trying. And I sat there looking at those impact drivers and I went, now let me think, that one makes about 700 foot pounds of torque and that one makes about 1200 foot pounds of torque. How is it that we're not using that mechanical advantage to get this thing off? And I don't like the idea of prying against the diff. Um, that metal is, is very fragile, is not intended to be pried on with a metal tool. And I see a lot of people doing that. We try not to do that because I have seen holes punctured through the diff. So I thought, man, I need to make something that's impact driven, pushes off the frame and is quick and easy to get this thing out. And at the same time that we launched the, the axle tubes, I started designing an axle puller. Um, obviously it's a lot more complicated than a tube. So it took months and months and months. Um, and actually we just launched it, the pre-orders for it this Sunday. Um, the reason for that was we tested this thing on Can-Ams, Hondas, Polaris's fronts, rears with the axle shaft in, with the axle shaft sheared. Um, we took it down to the Baja 1000. We took it down to the Baja 500. We did it on race cars. We did it on mud crawlers. We really wanted to encompass uh, you know, all the customers that would possibly be looking at this and make sure that this tool was reliable to them. Um, we initially under engineered the product and it was failing. It wasn't able to withstand the torque that those tools were creating. And so we just ramped it up, ramped it up and finally got a product that we beat the living hell out of. Um, and, and it can withstand it. Um, and, and then the other part of that is we wanted a tool that can be maintenance. Um, we decided not to go with solid rivets, but to use grade eight hardware so that the customer could actually take the tool apart and we could ship him another drive bolt. Um, we could ship him new um, shims. We could ship new arms. Um, and that customer would know that that tool is going to be around for the entire life of their vehicle. Um, so that, that one took a little more time, but so far we've seen a good response um, just from the small amount of pre-orders this week. Um, and we plan on continuing to manufacture those as long as people are looking to buy them. So when you were developing that tool, was it the fact that it was shearing, that it was failing, or, and that was what you were beefing up, like a thickness of the steel plate, or was it the, the hardware that was joining the, the two side walls of that clamp? There, there was two issues. The teeth, there's four teeth that really grab onto uh, that little divot that runs around the CV housing. And um, with the amount of force that we were creating, those teeth were kind of dulling, they were, they were bending. Um, so we upgraded to a 4130 um, steel or chromoly, um, which is a lot more, um, without getting too crazy into it, it's kind of, a, I would say, a harder, um, able to withstand that a little bit better. The other thing was the, the hardware that was holding the two sides together, as you compress that on that CV, that, that CV housing is in a circle while those teeth want to go outwards. It was shearing those, those bolts, that hardware, um, completely in half. Um, so we upgraded to a grade eight, everything, nuts, washers, everything is grade eight, um, and then zero failures since we did that. So, you know, if you look at the tensile strength of those, those objects between say a grade five and a grade eight, you know, you're talking about like 50,000, 70,000 PSI up to like 120,000. I mean, it's, it's almost right. double. Um, so we found that going up to that higher level gave us the strength we needed and the performance showed that. So is your target market for this, uh, the, the, the average UTV consumer, or is it the shops that have to maintain them, or is it both? I would say that it is definitely more the shops that do the maintenance, um, and then the race teams. The big advantage, because there's a, there's a thousand ways to pull a CV out. We've seen chains welded on in a tractor, and guess what? It got it out. Um, we don't have a tractor on the side of a race course. <laughs> right. So for racers, 
they want this out fast and they want it out dependable. And we've shown that I've pulled these CVs in less than five seconds from the time that you clamp it on to it coming out. So from the racer standpoint, it, it's a great tool to add to the chase trucks and to the race car, but that's a very small market. Um, the weekend warrior, average weekend warrior, would probably take their machine in to have an axle change. Unfortunately, we found that, you know, I grew up in the buggy world where you built the buggy. And so you understood every piece of it. Um, today, there are a lot of people who go to a motorsports dealer and possibly swipe a credit card and walk out with it. Or, you know, they may not be your seasoned vet of off-roading. And when something fails on the machine, I totally understand there's not that confidence of, I know what's going on and I can repair this. And so our local mechanics that we've spoken with here in San Diego have said one of the major, major reasons that people bring a machine to them in is an axle change. And it blew my mind to think like, you know, these things are very easy when they're intact to just pull them out. How is it that people aren't doing that? But but yet I, I try and look at it from their perspective and I get it. This is a $20,000, $30,000 machine. Maybe it's under warranty. Let's let the mechanic do this. So I felt, you know what, these guys that are pulling, you know, three of these a day, four of these a day, who knows, they probably want something too that's going to work fast and effectively and be able to pull these out. So that's kind of where our market is a little bit more. But guys like you and I that drive out in the middle of nowhere and bring spare axles, I'm going to have a CV puller on my 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 uh, rig. And we've gotten a lot of people reaching out to us that go on group rides and they they're 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 smart. They said, hey, there's 25 of us in the group everybody pitch in 10 bucks or, you know, whatever. And one guy in the group has it on his rig. So when they go out, somebody has one. It's, that's a great idea. You know, maybe not everybody needs one, but if you have one in the group, um, then whoever needs it, it'll be there to be able to use. Yeah. The, uh, the, the multiple times where we've gone out with groups into, into the long rides that we do, uh, that's kind of the concept that we have is, um, okay, uh, there's going to be five razors. One of you guys have a front axle. One of you guys have a rear axle. Um, at least two of you guys have belts. Um, and okay. There's going to be four can ams. You guys need to make sure you have X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, or, or if you have a, a Yamaha, you just don't bring anything cause it doesn't break, uh, unless it's a <laughs> steering rod. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's kind of the concept that, you know, as we, um, go out in groups together, you know, if, if one of us has the tool, we know we all have the tool, right? And so, uh, riding clubs, uh, this would be a great investment for them. It would be a great investment for just guys that always go out together, uh, to have at least one in the truck or one in the car where somebody can access it at some point. Um, but yeah, I'm, I've, I've been in the situation where I've been in the garage, um, with ratchet straps, uh, anchored to, uh, a, a, a stud on the wall with, you know, jacks in the air and pulleys to create more compression and wrap, you know, trying to hold the strap onto the cup to try to pull it out of the transmission, like, uh, slide hammers, you know, I've seen them take whole sides of transmissions off. So, um, you know, having a solution that actually is meant to do the job correctly, again, uh, testament to, uh, why I think your, your business is really kind of solidifying itself in great ideas to, to meet the, the needs with a great solution that, like you said, is not going to be a throwaway tool. It's going to be something that you can continue to use. If something were to ever go wrong, you could service it. Um, and it's, it's kind of the concept of like, um, high grade, uh, ratchet tools and things like that. You know, you can, you can pass them on to somebody else, uh, when the time comes. And so when something's made right, when it's made with quality, and like you said, <clears throat> this is also made in the United States completely made in the United States as well, right? Absolutely. Every every part, we laser cut all the steel here locally. Um, we, we do all the electroplating here locally. Um, we order the hardware from the same hardware company that we order everything else from, those bolts and nuts and everything. Um, even our packaging, it comes in a kind of like a Pelican case, a plastic hard shell case. Those are actually molded here in Southern California. Um, and the foam comes from the same foam we use in the in the uh, other cases that come from Washington. So we try to keep that same model, you know, with all of our products. And until I design a product that I'm just wedged into a corner where I can't, you know, we kind of found that with, with the tools that go in our toolkit. I just could not find tools um, from the U.S. that were not going to be more expensive than the entire case. Um, and so I said, you know what, we're, we're going to go with some some more lower grade tools so that if you did lose this on the trail, it's not the end of the day. We're not going to make this a five hundred dollar product because we have these fancy tools in here. And so we did go with some tools that were not made in the USA um, simply out of necessity. 
was my desire to keep it in the U.S. there? Absolutely. But again, at the end of the day, you're a business owner and and you have to make those tough decisions of what's going to work you know, best for the customers and for the company. Um, and so but 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 aside from that, we really do try to keep stuff quality made made here in the U.S. Um, and it's tough to do, but but it is possible. And to speak to that uh, belt case, um, if you buy the case without the toolkit, it does come with a uh, foam, like you said, sourced from Washington State. Shout out Washington! Woo! Um, the uh, the the foam itself is a multi-layer customizable foam, so you can cut, you can outline your tools, you can cut it out, and it'll have a nice little home uh, pocket in that case. Uh, so if you are somebody that has higher grade tools that you prefer to use, um, or if you have your own toolkit that you just want to kind of uh, move to the case instead of a bag behind the seat or whatever the case may be, you can do that uh, with the uh, more the the lesser uh, cost tool uh, or the case kit. Uh, you don't have to use those tools. You can use your own tools in the kit. And I've seen guys use the foam. I've seen guys you know just just jam them in the in the case with the belt. Uh, again, we're not advising you do that just because it's rubbing on the belt, but if you have uh, your your clutch tool, any clutch tool will fit in that foam as well. There's a space on the end of that foam for a clutch tool. You just outline the one that you have and you cut it in and you're good to go. Um, the toolkit includes the, the, the pliers and the, and the knife to cut your belt strands out. Um, but if you have a different solution for your kit or if you have a custom clutch where you need to have different components in that case that you wouldn't normally have on, on a OEM machine, um, you know, there's space to do that. And I, I really think that was just a great utilization of space. Um, and like you said, resourcing the, the tools to do that locally would just be cost prohibitive, prohibitive. You would lose all your margin points on your product. Right. So, um, you know, that's the, that's the solution that we sometimes don't like to admit, like just build it yourself because in the long run, you already have those tools laying around. So, um, yeah, that was a great, a great choice. So as a, as a business, there's a lot of small businesses in our community that like to come up with ideas. They have solutions for problems that they've run into. Um, what was it like to start your business? What kind of um, hurdles did you have to overcome? Or uh, do you have any tips for a small business that may be uh, in the same situation you were in 2018, where you had a problem you wanted to solve, a solution, an idea for a solution to solve that problem, and a possibility of launching that into the market? What kind of uh, process did you go through? What kind of tips maybe you would have for a small business? Yeah, it's, it's a difficult process. Um, I've yet to find a book or a video that sh says, you know, start your business. Here's how, you know, because there's so many different products and different variables and things. So it is very difficult to traverse that beginning stage and, and kind of grow your company. Um, I think what helped me was I kind of took, uh, I've always I was told years ago, the one with the most information wins. And I've tried to take that mindset of in life in general, um, usually whether you're having a, a disagreement with someone or you're trying to solve a problem, the more information you have, the better you'll do in that situation. And so I really started this entire thing with, let me learn everything there is to know about belts. I want to know how they're made. I want to know how they fail. Let me learn about clutches. Let me learn about these vehicles and really started just collecting information. I mean, coming back from being stuck in the desert, the very first thing I did was a Google search for a belt case. You know, I need to know if it even exists. What's the point of going down the, the path of creating something if someone has already started that? So, you know, doing a product search, doing a patent search, you know, doing all that kind of stuff to try and make sure that um, I, I'm starting out on the right foot because everything growing off of that, if, if you make a mistake in the beginning and say someone already had filed a patent and that product was already in the engineering phase and I got $25,000 into manufacturing of that, that's all to waste. So really uh, do your homework, make sure that you understand your product, your price point, your market. You know, what are people willing to pay? Are people interested in this? Um, and, and what are your competitors? Um, are they already shipping stuff from overseas? Because if your plan is to make something here in the U.S., and your competitors are, are shipping stuff from overseas, you're going to have a hard time getting a price point unless your product is unique enough or offers something specific to the customer that they're willing to pay that extra money for. Um, so just, just do your homework, get your information, ask questions. Uh, you know, we have people that have reached out to me and said, Hey, I've got this idea for this and that. And they DM me on Instagram and I'm, I'm willing to share the knowledge that I have because it is not easy. And it does take in a sense, an obsession. I became obsessed with creating products for my machines. 
um, and, and wanted to share those products with the public. If you have that drive and that obsession to create whatever your idea is, and you do a good job of collecting information, you have a really good chance of being successful. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the biggest things is, is just not assuming that you're going to be okay, but starting a business, you actually really have to uh, be willing to go all in with a business uh, of any size of any type, whether it be a product or a service. Um, you, you essentially have to live, eat, breathe that business. And like you were saying, knowledge is, is King, right? That's why companies like Facebook and Google and all these other guys are so huge because they're the ones that went out, developed the systems to create the information gathering and, and be the one that could speak to that topic or to provide the service sure. to that issue. So when you're talking about a product or a service, you really have to dive deep and and have uh, basically an answer to every question that somebody might throw your way. If someone's going to ask you, hey, why why is that belt case so th- narrow? It seems like like it's going to uh, cause a durability issue with those bends. Well, you took the time, you reached out to the resources and you talked to the experts, right? You talked to the people that know the answers for sure, 100% guaranteed that no one's going to argue with. And you're going to say, what's, what's, what's the answer to this problem? And, and when they can confirm your idea or they can help you adjust your expectation on that idea, um, that's where you're going to succeed because you have the answer, you have the definitive answer for the actual issue at hand. Um, and yeah. you have to, that's where you have to be as a business. You have to have the answers to the questions. You have to have the, um, the drive to push it through and you have to have the heart to tell people, you know, this, this sometimes is the wrong thing and we have the yeah. right thing here. And, and, and also know, know what you're good at, know your limitations. You don't see me designing trophy truck products because I don't own one. Uh, I've never driven one and I wouldn't know where to start. Um, but I'm obsessed with UTVs. We have four of them, um, and and I'm I've taken uh, I've done motor swaps. You know, we've we've taken these things down to the nuts and bolts, taken them apart. And uh, you know, if you're going to try and start a business for something that is a big part of your life, you're probably going to be more successful than just something that may be fun or maybe trendy or cool. You know, um, know your limitations. I don't create the patents for my products. I hire an attorney. Um, I don't do all the CAD designs and everything. I do my my basic CAD design and then I take it to an engineer who, who does that stuff. So, you know, know what you're good at, know what you're not and look for help from those other people um, that can help you get your product to the, to the finish point that you want it to be. So you said you do some of your CAD yourself. Did you have to learn how to do some of this on your own or was it something that you already knew from a previous education? No, I did. Um, I used to use Microsoft Paint and just make a two dimensional, you know, squares and circles when I first started designing stuff. And I went, wow, this is really limiting. Um, and I luckily stumbled upon um, back then it was called, well, I think it's still around. It's called SketchUp and SketchUp, Google yeah. put it out and it's a super basic CAD. I mean, there's a thousand videos on YouTube of how to use it. And it allowed me to start to create two scale 3D files. So I could get that idea out of my head and into um, a model where I could see, does this pivot point make contact with something else when this moves? Okay, that needs to be smaller. And then from there, like I said, that's a great program. And it's it was free to download when I downloaded it. Yep. And then I would make that model and I would take it to the engineer who would then plug it into SolidWorks, which would do the same kind of thing. But then they could apply stress testing like they do on the suspension components of these trophy trucks. You know, they build an A-arm set. They actually cycle the travel and look at where the stress is being exerted. So, you know, it's all in different levels. Um, When I started, yeah, it was pen and paper. It went to Microsoft Paint, then on to SketchUp. And now usually most of our stuff comes out of SolidWorks. Yeah, and that's really kind of where the the investment comes in, right? Is you can take it to it from a point of idea and conceptualization, but when it comes to actually testing, uh, before investing more money into production of the product, uh, investing in a good engineer that can tell you what you're doing wrong before you even test it, and then put it in a software simulation system that'll actually stress test it. And, and we're talking about a product, a physical product scenario, but um, you know that's where your investment of time will save you money down the road, right? You're, yep. you're, if you can have somebody that knows what they're talking about, that this is their job to create things out of nothing, to prove that they're going to work, you're going to save thousands upon thousands of dollars later on when you're um, having to you know, recycle those products when they come back as bad. Um, yep. and, uh, and, and so that it, 
it's definitely worth your time to talk to experts, even if you can't invest the money into paying them to do it, at least finding somebody that's willing to talk to you and let you know where your shortcomings are right at the gate so that you're not having to, you know, reap those, those issues down the road. Yeah. Which, especially in the off-road industry, I had some engineer friends that, that do for big companies, you know, CAD designs and stuff. And uh, when I kind of told them this idea, they said, can I look at it? I want to see it. You know, I'll, I'll help you. I'll help you. And none of it was, uh, you know, I, some of these guys are making uh, or being charged about $120 an hour or so for engineering, which, you know, they're, they're doing a professional job and deserve to be paid for that. But you'd be amazed at how many of them might be able to just give you a few tips or take a look at your design and, and yeah, go, Hey, did you think about this? Do you think about that and not have the, the high expense, but Ultimately, if you want to design a product that you're going to mass produce, you know, we've shipped these Savage cases all over the world now. We have thousands of them out. You really do need to take the time to pay a professional engineer to, to, to make sure this product is going to last. The last thing I would want to hear is that someone had a case on their car and was out in the middle of nowhere, had a belt break, and for some reason – you know, my belt case didn't protect their belt or whatever. That that's the ultimate. Like, oh my gosh, I'm I'm. The effect is the exact opposite of what my intentions were. Um, and the only way to really prevent that effectively is to have a totally inclusive um, look at this by engineers, by users. Um, I mean, the, so our first prototypes that we ever made for this, we made we made twelve of them, and the first thing we did with them was put them on 12 cars in the 2018 Baja 1000. We went right to the Baja 1000. I said, I don't want to know if this is going to bounce around on my five mile trail ride. We put them on these cars that did, I think it was 813 miles that year. Um, and I was there standing at the finish line as these UTVs came back in with it on the car. And I wanted to see it. I wanted to see, could it handle the vibrations, the, the temperature, the moisture case on the outside? Um, zero failures, zero openings. And I was like, okay, this is a good starting point. Um, and we, we continued to test it from there. So really do your job to make sure that your product is, is, is providing the customer with what they're paying for. Yeah, you, you said uh, about maybe talking to some of the engineers in the community and testing it at a race with some, with some racers. Um, there's, a, there's a saying that goes around a small business. That it's not about what you know, but who you know. Um, I, I tend to kind of lean a little bit away from that in the idea that um, it's who, you know, is going that can, that possibly if they're willing to help you is going to help you get going faster, but it's really your drive that pushes you into getting this across the finish line. How, how, how do you see those ratios of what, you know, versus who, you know? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, I would say nothing is more valuable, um, as a business owner to be successful than your work ethic. Um, if you have that drive and that motivation, every speed bump, every issue, every, I mean, look at our current situation in the world right now and what's going on as a small business owner with a, a company that's just starting out. Um, how do I adapt to this change? Um, and in this case, you know, maybe some people that I know in the industry does help me out a little bit, but I, I would stand uh, by the fact that my drive and my motivation to adapt to this environment and overcome or any other engineering issue or price issue um, it is more based off of my um, obsession to make sure that this thing is successful than it is my relationships. Not to downplay the relationships. We have met a lot of great business owners. Some of the best racers on the face of the earth live just a few miles away from me and have been a huge resource um, to, to telling me, hey, Matt, that's not going to work or mm, maybe try this. And, and that's the other thing as a business owner, you got to accept your axle tube <laughs> failures. <laughs> you know, you got to You got to be able to see this is going to work. This is not going to work and take that feedback as I, I look at it as not, Hey, this doesn't work. I look at it as, Hey, this can be improved and make those improvements. Kind of that whole uh, fail fast mentality of, of take your losses and learn from them and move forward. Um, it, but uh, I would say that, you know, the relationships 
when you're building a small business um, are crucial once you've come to the conclusion of putting a product out there, right? That's where your relationships are really going to are going to shine. Um, and surrounding with people with you that want to see you succeed, right? Making sure that people are, are there to support you and your brand um, in the best light possible, not in not in, a, in an artificial way, not to just say, yeah, my buddy has this thing, you should check it out. But as in they've tried it, you've let them experience it, you've let them uh, become a testimonial for you, and t- to put a to put the honesty out into the into the market. I think that one of the biggest failures in marketing these days is the artificial um, uh, spokesmanship of, for a product or a brand. Um, you know, we didn't bring you on here just to promote uh, uh, the the views and the likes on on our content. We we brought you on. We asked you to come to our podcast, right? Because we can see that you've put in the effort. You've have a, a, a positive attitude towards all this. You have um, a, an ethic and a work method that goes into making a great product and, and and a business in in our in our community. And I know there's a lot of people out there looking for that um, indirect mentorship, right? They want to know, you know, what's working, what doesn't work. Why am I wasting my time on this? I should be doing something else. You know, I started side by side guys because there were, I I saw a passion. I saw something. I was in a completely different industry. I'm, I was doing, you know, networking and programming and and servers and all this other stuff, which is all nerd stuff. But through that experience, I, I found this new passion and I and I drove all in on it. So, um, you know, that's kind of where you are. You're you're currently working in a different <laughs> profession, right? But you're yeah. supporting a passion that's driving you forward. And and when you're obsessed with it, you really have to take it by the reins and just and say, I'm going to do this, and I'm and I'm going to surround my myself with people that are going to support that idea. And, yeah. um, and I've know you've, t- you said a number of times your wife has given you inspiration on different things and, and, and having a partner that's going to support what you're doing is a huge, uh, a part of that puzzle, right? They're going to be the one that support supports you when you're down, says that you can keep going, you can do it again. You, I have a different idea for you. Maybe try this. Here's a different perspective on what you're telling me. Um, and so, uh, I think that, a support system is crucial, and that includes family, that includes business friends, uh, industry friends, um, something as simple as somebody that you've ridden with before, or um, that you've you you met at an event. You know, those people can give you perspective that you're never going to get anywhere else outside of ex- expanding your boundaries, getting out of your bubble, and trusting somebody else to be honest with you and accepting that feedback. Absolutely, yeah, and 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 ultimately, I think you and I are similar. Right? we're just a fan of this industry. Um, I, I'm, you know, earlier this year, we uh, were able to put cases on um, Ken Block's car. Um, Toby Price is running our cases on his car. Um, you know, I can list the professional racers that are out there um, that are that are using our products. And and ultimately, I'm, I'm blown away that these individuals that I look up to, you know, as a, as a fan of off-roading, um, it, it is amazing to be able to get their feedback and their input. And I'm always open to it because it's only going to make the product better in the end. And as a industry guy, um, you know, when partners show up with new products and new things that they want to work with industry partners, uh, you know, whether that be a small business or a more reputable business, um, coming from a place that you've worked with sponsorships and you've worked with athletes and you've worked with other businesses where, um, you may cohabitate on a, on a bill or something like that. Um, what what do you look for when someone approaches you to say, hey, we got this new product. We're a small business. We're starting out. We want to get into the community and show our product off. What kind of things do, does a does an OEM or a manufacturer of third party parts uh, look to do partnerships with these companies? Because, like Matt said, um, you're 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 wanting to put your best product forward and get the best feedback, but at the same time, you're trying to grow a business as well. So, um, what what do you look for when people approach you to say, hey, can we partner on something? Well, it it depends on how you want me to answer that question because there's two ways of looking at it. There's, there's me personally and based on what I need out of, uh, equipment for the riding that I do. And then there's full throttle, you know, full throttle. We have, we have a handful of customers or I'm sorry, a handful of, uh, quote unquote, like partners that we partner with from, um, sponsorship standpoints. We work together with them on content, uh, but in terms of people that we actually partner with um, for product release and stuff like that, a lot of times it's going to have to be something that fits into the battery world, if that makes sense. But in terms of uh, my own personal vehicle, um, it's kind of taking almost like a boutique type shape to it. Like if there's one thing that I learned, I've learned over the last couple of years is uh, 
what, you know, I, I've gotten very comfortable with what I need on my machine. And I've kind of almost been like borderline obsessed with the best. Like if you go down the list, if you go down every part, every component that I have on my car, it's, it's, it's thought out. It's based on what I know. When we go into the Frank Church wilderness and we are 300 to 400 miles from anything, from any help or anything like that, it's gear that I can rely on. So I, I don't know if that answered your question, but, uh, so what I so what I hear out of that is um, you, everybody every company and, and person behind a company is going to have their own personality and needs when it comes to their projects and their builds and their things like that um, and and so what I'm hearing you is don't try to force it on somebody if it's not the right product for that company don't just you know try to push it through and don't and, and if a different company is working and asking you for your product and it's not a good match. Uh, don't waste your time and your money investing into that. Invest into things that are a good fit for you and for your brand and for the message that you're trying to portray. Is, would, would that be accurate? It, it would be accurate, but you also have to kind of invest in, you have to invest in people too. It's interesting. Like some of the biggest advocates that I've noticed with full throttle battery are some of our smallest guys. You know, it, it's really interesting in that fashion. So, so people that will represent, like, well, it goes back to what I was just saying earlier about Investing in people that are willing to be honest and honest in a positive way where it could be negative feedback, but as long as that negative feedback is constructive and it's going to push you brand forward and push and push you in a positive way, uh, you need that. You need somebody that's not going to just gloss over uh, the facts or just gloss over the one thing. Like if, you, if you're in development of a product or a service and there was a hiccup or there was a thing, like if you don't hear about that thing, you're not going to know to fix it. Um, right. I've... The, the other thing, the other thing that you kind of got to take into account, and this is where things get really, really challenging from a marketing standpoint is you have to, you have to pick and choose who you're working with as well. Like as it pertains to me, if, if I'm offered something that, that I feel is going to provide me with some benefit to my machine, to my overall ride quality, I will look for every opportunity to talk to people about that product. It's, 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 it's total reciprocation it, it, and it's because I believe in it, you know, and, and this podcast, this, everything that we're doing is kind of like this love letter that we're giving to off-road and communicating these messages, these success stories and stuff like that. The stuff that we know is working because, you know, like I said, we're doing runs out there. We're going out on rides that, uh, they they might be, they might be out of reach for some people. So we're definitely putting stuff to the test. When I see that stuff thrive in situations like that on rides like that, you bet you're behind. I'm going to talk about that stuff because I know it's not a product. It's a solution. Yeah, Matt, when you when you're talking to I mean, I mean, you had to start from nothing, right? You started from a place of like you didn't have a, a previous brand that pivoted. You didn't have a, a brand that was already kind of out there. And then you had a new product in the off road world. Right. So when you were approaching people, what kind of what kind of approaches did you find that worked and didn't work um, in w approaching a person or a team or a company? Yeah. When we first started out, you know, we went to our first couple of races and trade shows and events where we had booths and stuff. And my, my angle that I took was, I know this product is awesome and I know what I have. And if I can just get people to see it, I think it'll catch on. And so I went around to all the other booths. I woke up early and before the show opened and I went around to all the other booths and every car that I saw there, I said, do you guys want a case? It's a brand new product. You can put your belts in here. I'll do the mounting for you. You don't have to pay me anything. I'll put it on your car. And I and at that show, we put probably about 15, 20 cases up on these cars. As the show opened and people came in, they started walking around and these customers saw these cases and they're like, what is that? You know, they, they'd never known what it was. And, and we gave them, we had printed out an image uh, of a belt in there and created a foam insert. So it looked like they were full of the stuff that we would normally put in it. Um, and so they were able to open that up and go, oh, I get it. Wow. I've never seen this before. And they came back to our booth and said, I saw this over at the Trinity Racing booth or the Rockford Fosgate booth. Um, and we we established those relationships, not only with the customer who saw it on the ride, but with those other companies that went, wow, these guys just simply gave us the product because they believe in it. And that the customers just looking at it would be enough to, to, to buy off on it. Um, you know, and, and prior to that, we knew it would perform. We had been in the Baja 1000. We had done all those. So there was no question that we had a winner. We just needed people to see that. And so for me, it took waking up earlier than, than anyone else and getting down there to make that happen. 
Um, and then looking at ways that we can get these on racers cars. And um, I've had a couple other companies tell me, hey, you're hitting the racers too much. That's not your customer. Your customer is the weekend warrior. And I said, I agree with you 100%. But the racers get a great amount of exposure. And they do something that the weekend warrior doesn't. For me, they put hundreds, if not thousands of miles on their machines in the most brutal conditions. So being a young product and a young company, I want to throw this, you know, to the lions <laughs> right off the uh, off the bat to speed up that 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 awkward process of making changes to your mold and adapting things and creating improvements. Um, and the racers allowed me to do that. And I'm, I'm thankful to them. And we provide them with product. Um, some of our racers don't even really put our decals on their car. Um, to me, I would rather have people see the case on the car than my logo on your vinyl wrap. Um, and so that was kind of the angle we took was get out there, put them on vehicles, let people try these things, let people use these things and let them fall in love with the product. One of the things that you said um, could easily be glossed over, but I wanted to highlight it. Uh, when you were out there trying to get these cases on the machines, you didn't put the because a lot of times as small business owners, you you put a lot of pressure on yourself to 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 put it in a perfect light before it ever sees anybody's eyes. Uh, and and you went out and you said, I want to put this case on your car. I'm I'm not going to go buy a hundred belts to put belts in this case, right? You you said I'm going to put a printout of a belt in the case so that people understand what the concept is. A lot of times we think that we have to like we get we get roadblocked by things like I'd have to put belts in this case for people to really understand what's going on. Be creative. Think about outside that box a little bit and just say, how can I tr convey the message? Not necessarily show it in a, in the perfect way, in a perfect scenario. Um, and I think that it's really important for small businesses to think outside that box. We're in a situation right now where we, a lot of the country is getting locked into their homes. Um, and we have to think outside that box. We got to think, how can I survive this, this thing? Uh, and what can I, what resources do I have that can accomplish the idea or the concept or the whatever to, uh, bring us across the finish line to get that sale or to get that, um, customer on board or that business to accept kind of the, the promotional agreement we want to go with. So, um, that's one thing that I think we just always forget when we're in the thick of it. We don't see outside the blinders of, of development of that small business. And I think, um, uh, being creative, thinking outside the box is a huge part of growing a small business. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, we've talked a lot about, you know, how we got to this point. Um, what does the future of Savage UTV look like? Like what kind of things can you talk to without giving away, you know, maybe something that's top secret, uh, cause you're making a, 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 a case for a nuclear bomb or something. I don't know what you would do over there, but, um, what kind of things can you say to like, how is your business growing? How's it evolving? What kind of things are you excited to, to look forward to? I think the biggest thing is we want to stay involved. Um, you know, if you look at, uh, most of our products are UTV related. Um, you look at the Yamaha Rhino, you know, and the, how that came out and you look at these vehicles today, like the, the four seater build that we're working on and, and some of these cars that are coming out of these manufacturers, um, the industry, the UTV industry is adapting and growing at such a rapid speed that we want to be involved. You're going to see us at races. You're going to see us out on group rides. You're going to see us camping with my wife and kids in the desert. Because every time I do those things, I learn something more about the car. I learn something more about the customer and the industry. Um, and so the future is just to stay fresh. Look at what customers are looking for. Um, you know, if a lot of people are having uh, issues with a certain part of their vehicle or a certain part of their ride or the experience, how can we take a, a viewpoint in that that is going to give them a product that, that, that they're going to be happy with? Um, you know, and so, so just to, to continue to stay active and, and, and be involved and, and, and honestly, the, the racing side of this does give me a, an angle where I really see, um, a lot of people that take a lot of effort into dissecting their vehicle and how it's working and how can it better work. Um, and so fostering those relationships, um, is definitely going to help. We will have more, more products coming out for sure. I've always said, I don't want to just sell cases. You know, I want to have uh, uh, down the road a business that is essentially a, a shopping, um, you know, place for people of UTVs. Um, we are bringing in another product. That's the other thing is that I realize I'm not going to solve every problem. And there's a lot of other great minds out there. And so we've partnered up with Trinity Racing to be able to sell their belts. 
Um, and we are bringing on board, uh, if you are familiar with Rotopax and the yep. fuel cans and water storage, it's a great product. You talk about something that is made to just really take a beating. If you've ever held their products compared to, you know, Joe Blow gas can, very thick molded, very well built. Um, I've seen these things on cars upside down where you'd think the fuel would be leaking out, watertight, great product. They are coming out with, or just came out with um, what's called roll packs. And it is a more of a UTV specific. And it's funny when you look at it, it looks exactly like a Savage case. It's a cage mounted um, fuel can Yep. that I think is really marketed great towards the UTV industry. Why would I sit there and try and invent or copy that great idea? We reached out to them and said, can we sell your products? We think that they're fantastic. Um, and we went through the process of coming on board with them as a dealer and put in our first order with them and you will be able to get their products through Savage UTV. So again, know what you're good at, know what you're not, know what other people are good at. And as the future goes forward with this industry, um, try and bring those great products to the customers uh, that are looking for those solutions. So you've mentioned a couple of times uh, uh, a, a vehicle that you have. Uh, you mentioned you have a, a few different vehicles, but you have one that's a little bit special. And I think you've uh, named it Greta uh, at this yes. point, right? Yeah, I think uh, Greta is a very unique uh, and interesting uh, vehicle. Uh, what What is it and, and why did it ever come to be and, and how did it come to be? Yeah. So, so the original um, idea was we do a lot of shows and we're out in the public a lot with our products and we wanted a vehicle that, that we could display our products on. Um, now we could go get a, a stock car and put it up there. And in a lot of, tar in a lot of sense, that would actually probably re be more relatable to our average customer because they would see a stock cage and, and see how it's mounted on there. But we also are very active in this industry. I'm part of a local race team here where we help with the chasing and the pitting and the pre-running and the supporting. And so I wanted a vehicle that could not only sit in my booth as a display, but that I could also take down to Mexico and run 700 miles of the nastiest open desert terrain on it and have everything I need in that vehicle to perform the way I want it to with a couple buddies and a cooler, spare axles and everything, uh, you know, the way I like to off-road. I also wanted to be able to take my wife and my two kids out to Glamis for the weekend or Superstition and be able to tool around camp and have the comforts of, um, and the safety of a reliable car. So we took a 2019 two-seat uh, Polaris Turbo and we essentially cut the entire thing off, except really the front suspension um, brackets and the rear engine mount. We did a complete full tube chassis. We stretched the car so it's a couple inches longer uh, than, a st than a stock four seat, but not yet as long as like the Can-Am four seat that I call it a limousine. Yeah. Um, we went to what we thought was the sweet spot to have that stability um, and that wheelbase. It gave the back seat more legroom, and it allowed us to put a 25-gallon fuel cell to the rear of the car behind a firewall. Wow. Again, it's safer. You're not sitting on it. The kids aren't sitting on a fuel cell. It allowed us to drop the seats down lower for a lower center of gravity, but to have that capacity, 25 gallons, in that car to go down and run hundreds of miles in Mexico. Um, the tube chassis, obviously, is a safety thing. Um, we did half doors. We wanted side impact, but we also didn't want to climb through a window like a race car. Um, so the half doors are are beautiful. They're actually fully enclosed, just like a Jeep door would be. It's not just a tube and a skin. Um, the seats are heated seats with adjustable lumbar support. There's a windshield with wipers and sprayers. Uh, Rockford Fosgate gave us this incredible stereo system. We really wanted to meet performance and safety, both for the family and for someone that would go do some hardcore off-roading, you know, out in the middle of nowhere and basically build, we, we started calling it the pre-runner and we've really changed to calling it the adventure UTV. This thing can go anywhere and do anything. Um, in fact, the back of the car opens up, there's slide out trays with tool storage um, that uses packs that you can take out for gear or storage. You can throw a spare tire in there. This whole thing is like a Lego set. The car comes apart and can be adapted to the specific ride that you're going to do. Um, I'm actually going in two days to pick it up. It's up at ProLine getting the wrap and then the car is done. So we'll start to have it out in the media. We'll have it at our, at our events. It's been a nine month process to get this thing, but it's been a vision that's been hard to get it exactly uh, of what I'm envisioning. So that's kind of how a lot of people are like, hey, you keep teasing us, you keep teasing us. 
Um, and it's because it's it's been a process that we've changed and adapted, um, but we're finally at a point where I'm like, this this is what I was looking for, and we're there. I'm happy. Um, it's time to show it off. And I would have to say that uh, I am a fan of it without its skins on. I think it looks pretty <laughs> brutal without uh, any of the dressing. But uh, yeah. for a lot of guys, they, you know, obviously when you're in a dusty environment, having the, those panels on makes a huge difference too. So um, I, I think it looks pretty brutal the way it, <laughs> the way it is now, but I can't wait to see it when it's done. So, um, But uh, when it goes into building something like that, obviously you're going to have a really good relationship with a fabricator that knows what he's doing. Uh, but what, uh, what, what partners did you go with on this and what kind of um, equipment did you get on this machine? Yeah, we, we wanted to partner up with um, some really great companies because when you're trying to build something that's really top notch, obviously you have a budget to work within, um, but you want the best of the best. And we lucked out because we got some of the best companies to come on board and help us with this. Um, the, the frame builder who built the frame is American Engineering out in Arizona. Um, this is the first of these cars. Um, he's already working on a second uh, for another customer and is able to build these custom pre-runner adventure cars for you. Um, we got PRP seats, like I said, they're beautiful GT3 seats that are heated, they have lumbar support, they're so comfortable. Um, Rugged Radios did all of our electronics as far as the intercom system and race radios, headsets, helmets, um, switch pros. If you look at our dash, there is not a single button switch or anything. Everything is what run through our switch pros, they're backlit, it's amazing, it's, it's a great product. Um, Trinity did our exhaust. They did a stage five system. They did some of our clutching and a big brake kit. Um, Rockford Fosgate stereo system, like I had mentioned earlier. We did a UMP air intake because I wanted, we've run those on all our race cars and they clean the air amazing um, without any fancy gadgets or gasmos or anything. So we went with one of those for reliability. Um, and then fuel wheels and tires. The crazy thing was there's, we put 35s on this car. Um, which you're starting to see more of now, but when we were back designing this, it was like, are we going to do that? Right. Um, their wheels and tires are, are awesome. The beadlock wheels, um, it, it's just such a great uh, package to put on the car that with us expanding the size of the vehicle bigger, we wanted that bigger tire on there. Um, and so we're super happy with that. Um, Assault Industries did a ton of stuff in the car from the mirrors to the steering wheel. Um, a lot of our brackets are fire extinguisher brackets. Um, they make really great stuff. And then honestly, uh, the the most favorite part of the car for me is the Baja Designs lighting. We have, I want to say there's over 13 different lights on this car. We have rock lights, we have dome lights, we have all of our front driving lights for long distance and for short distance and, and, and kind of more of a wide spectrum lighting. Um, and then we have scene lights, we have rear lights. Um, they, they make some of the best lights out there um, they're just the, the, they're another local company. They're actually here in Southern California. And for me, I love to go out at night and I won't do it if I can't see where I'm going. And these lights absolutely turn on a light switch when you're out in the middle of nowhere. Um, so we've had great, great, great companies. Um, we bought the car from Ivan Stewart Motorsports here locally, um, and are hoping to be able to bring that car back to them to have on, on display so people can come to that dealership and look at it. Um, and, and just to continue the relationships with all these companies who make the coolest stuff out there to be able to put on this car so people can see, hey, if you want, if you have this crazy idea and you want to make something specific to your needs, it is possible. And these are the people that, that will help you do that. You know, they provide products that can get you clear communication, great visibility at night, soft suspension, great exhaust, you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think that, uh, a lot of what goes into a build like that is uh, the relationships that you're building as a small business, the, the guys that you're talking to and spending time with. Um, and then just the fact that you're thinking outside the bubble and doing something different. Uh, a lot of times we try to get people on board to help us grow uh, without providing value back to them. And when you're, when you're a small business, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to provide value back to those other, other companies and those other people, because that's, that's their, that's their trade. That's their investment of their time and their, and their efforts. Because a lot of times it's not about the physical product. It's about the time and the mental capacity that that person has to give to you. And, uh, it, it, you really have to provide value back to them. And so when you, when you put a build like this together, it's not just another razor. It's not just another, uh, can am overland build it's not just a, a, a xyz whatever it's 
it's literally something different, something unique, something that's pushing the boundaries. That's that's kind of thinking outside the box of what's normal and um, involving people that really care, that have a passion and that, that are willing to talk and to, to describe and show off and all that kind of stuff. Really big, important ideas that a small business owner really needs to to take to heart is is working with those people that have that passion. And if you don't have that passion, they're going to say no. If you're not representing the same heart that they have for the community and the industry, they're not yeah. going to work with you because they only want to work with people that are passionate, that are going to help them grow bigger, uh, not bigger as in a business like monetary, but grow them bigger as um, the passion <clears throat> just gets bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper. So um, that that's really kind of... Um, an example of that kind of process. And I, I really like that machine. I really like the, the, the brands that you're putting on it. Um, and you know, uh, I know that Ian's got some Baja, uh, stuff, uh, in shop to get reviewed and, and looked at onto his X3. And, uh, I can't say enough about those lights. Like you were saying, they really do light, uh, light up the night. So, um, you spoke a little bit about, uh, the other mach- or having multiple machines. You have a little, uh, use it a 170 in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a six-year-old daughter and an eight-year-old son, and uh, they each have their own 170, um, which when we started going out to the desert, you know, they were in a, uh, a Power Wheels, um, you know, scooting around, and then they went to the 50, uh, Honda 50 with training wheels, and now that they're a little bit older, and, and for me, a big safety thing is knowing that they're, you know, in a helmet, in a cage, um, with a harness, um, it's great to be able to put them in these Polaris vehicles and let them go off on their own where, you know, we can watch them, but they're kind of learning, you know, acceleration and braking and awareness and, and, and all of that. But then we can go on a ride. And my son, when he was five years old, did a 26 mile ride in that 170 with other adult cars. He was the only kid driving himself and, and did it. And, and the confidence that that built in him and, uh, you know, now he's racing. Um, we, we were lucky enough to, uh, to get a, a 170 built by Cognito Motorsports. And his first race out of the gate in the higher class, um, he won both races. Um, so he, he he's taking that ability that he developed out in the open desert on family trips now with a better machine and being able to go out there and compete. And, and the whole family enjoys it. That's the, the thing is my daughter's having a blast. My wife's having a blast. We're all having a blast. Um, and I think that's part of why I love this industry is it just it, it really can be something that the whole family can get into uh, and enjoy. And and I really hope my son racing and who knows, maybe my daughter will get into racing, um, that they'll learn how to work on a vehicle, change their oils, change your tire and all those things that that they can take as a young adult out into the world and be prepared you know, to handle themselves. Um, by learning that here. And even my son, his first race, I told him, first thing he came back up when he drove off the track, I said, drive around and go congratulate every single one of your competitors. Even though he won the race, uh, you know, and he was ready to celebrate, I thought it was very important he learns that that you won this one, but you're not going to win them all. And the most important part is you go around and you say good job to all those other people who maybe don't get to enjoy that first place trophy that you got, but are out there having fun just like you are and 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 those kind of life lessons that i hope he he takes with him as he grows older yeah i think racing is definitely one of those things that we always forget about because we see all the pro level riders in baja and the mint and all those things and we think that's out of reach but we most areas will have a local track of some sort that we can get our, our young ones involved in to to learn those life lessons to learn sticking through something that's painful looking through uh, failure to you know what the positive outlooks are um, building relationships with people that you're competing with um, and yeah. having a positive attitude towards uh, something that you want so badly but uh, uh, unfortunately sometimes you have to take your knocks and and all those life lessons are so important and there's very few um, industries that those lessons can come through on uh, you can say that a lot of times it it's sports, but at the same time, sports has become so um, egotistical these days uh, and so self-centered with brand, you know, becoming a brand yourself and things like that, um, that it's starting to get a, kind of a little bit away from that. Um, and yeah. so uh, with our industry, there's a huge opportunity for us as parents. Um, I have two young boys that love off-roading and all that. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of life lessons that can come from our industry, and I think that it's just a huge opportunity if you have the means to provide a machine for your young one, if you have the ability to get out to a racetrack, or even just 
you know, for fun as a family, get out and be competitive. Those things will always come back in spades. Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited about where your where your company is going, and I'm I can't wait to see uh, what your what the future looks like for you and your and what you're doing. Um, I I totally want to see your young guy out there on the podium too. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's always fun. Um, you've been super generous uh, with letting us uh, have some of your product for testing and to put on our vehicles. Um, and so I I just want to make sure that I'm I'm portraying our gratitude for that and um, how how awesome of a product it is. I I don't want to sell mm-hmm. oversell it, but uh, really it's the only solution out there for the for the issue uh it's the only product that's going to protect your belt in the in the way that it does um and i think that it's about time we give the opportunity to the community to win one of these what do you think fully supported absolutely so you said that your um your cases have gone through a couple revisions um in our review we talked about the latches and, and you said that uh you went back to the drawing board with developing some new latches and making it easier to open and close um one of the other things that i called out in our review was actually the um the top vent having the ability to uh come un unscrewed and come out uh and i noticed that on your latest version you actually have a nut in there as well so you, you you've uh, you've identified these issues before we even got a review out so i think that's pretty awesome and a testament to testing and getting feedback uh from the community so uh props there uh we actually have one of your newest versions here uh this is what we're calling i guess the gen 3 uh case and it has uh, the updated latches. It has the updated vent uh, cover or a vent button. Uh, and we want to give one of these away to the community. So uh, you've generously donated this uh, case to us to uh, find a new home. And uh, we're going to give us away to uh, listeners of the podcast and fans of, of the social sites and websites. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, you can go to sidebysideguys.link slash savage, and that'll take you to our homepage, uh, to a sweepstakes page where you can enter to win this case. Um, we'll, this will be also available on our Facebook page under a sweepstakes tab. So if you are on Facebook, you can go to that tab, click uh, sweepstakes, and uh, enter there as well. And basically, all you have to do is give us your email address so that we can notify you of winning or not winning, right? Um, but uh, also, for every time you visit one of uh, Savage YouTube, TV's um, social pages, website, um, you'll get an additional entry into the sweepstakes. So uh, please go there, give uh, Matt's website a, a visit, give his social media pages a like and a follow. Um, and then once you've done that, uh, that'll give you, I think, four entries into the sweepstakes. And then once you're done with that, it'll actually unlock uh, the same thing for our website. So if you want an additional four entries, you can go to our website, go to our social pages and like and follow those if you haven't already done that. Um, and even if I, th- I think if, even if you have, uh, liked or followed us, if you go do the process, it'll still give you those entries. So, um, yeah, uh, we want to, we want to give back to the community. And one thing that I like to do is to bring in brands and products that, uh, exceed expectations and, and do the job well. Um, and, uh, I invited Matt onto the podcast because I know that he has a very interesting story to tell on the business side of it and the product development side of it and having a passion. And that's really what it comes down to a passion passion to do well in the community, to provide something to the community that's a benefit. Um, And again, you've been generous to us and we want to be generous to the community. So uh, we have this case to give away. Uh, Go to sidebysideguys.link slash savage uh, to enter or to go to our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash sidebysideguys. Uh, And we would really appreciate um, that you would follow and like uh, the Savage UTV pages as well. Um, And we we can't say enough about the product. Uh, Matt, you've been a great positive person in our community and we really appreciate that. Um, I know a lot of the uh, racers and guys that you've been working with can really appreciate what you're doing for for them in the fact that you're just providing the product, the right product for the right, uh, uh, the right solution for the problem. So um, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast. Um, I know that uh, I, I've, I've tried to let you talk as much as possible. I'm trying not to, to steal some thunder there, but um, I know you have uh, just come off of a 48 hour tour at work. Yeah. Yeah. 48 hours of fun. Yeah, so over at the uh, at the fire station, right? And um, I know in California, you guys are, are locked down over there uh, because of the uh, coronavirus. Uh, we just got down uh, locked down here in Washington State this week um, by our governor, and so that's why we're doing this remote stuff. Um, but uh, I just really want to portray the idea that uh, we're all in this together, and we're going to try to provide more content like this to our community because. 
you're at home, you have nothing to do. Well, you can, you can partake in our podcast. So, um, uh, as a, as an EMT type of guy, uh, do you have any tips for us, uh, trying to stay safe and healthy out there? Yeah, I, I think, you know, seeing kind of the call changes that, that we've seen, you know, with going on these responses for people that are symptomatic, you know, as first responders, we're taking extra precautions from how we used to do things. And I think that the public should just do the same thing. Um, again, uh, understand what this is. You know, you can't believe everything you see on TV or Facebook. Um, so do some research, figure out what it is. If you are somebody that does have, um, you know, elderly or someone who's immunocompromised or things like that, you probably should be taking more precautions than the average person. Um, you know, my kids are home from school. We run our business pretty much from home. Um, so not much of a change there, but we have had to, to not go see grandpa and grandma as much. Um, we have made a couple trips out to the desert where they're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, instead of going to the park or Disneyland or something, we, we're either staying home or going somewhere where there really isn't anybody around. Um, you know, I think that in the end, this country has always found a way to get through times like this. Um, but you know, to each individual person, just be smart and understand your area where you're at and, and, and the, the, the differences with, you know, population density and all those things that can affect the spread of this. And that the concept, the ultimate concept is if we just take a little bit of time to create some space, that it will greatly, you know, decrease um, the amount of spread on this. So we're trying to do our part, but still continue to um, live our lives and and have our, our kids enjoy their lives and, and continue to do business, continue to work at the fire station and uh, just wait till, you know, we get through this. As a as a first responder yourself, how can we as the community uh, best support our first responders and our health system uh, from your perspective? I, I tell you, there's a lot of advice uh, about, you know, using the phone um, to reach out to clinics and, and physicians and things like that. I think what we're used to is something's wrong, call 911. And we don't want to inundate the system with that. And we don't want to expose uh, people that maybe don't need to be exposed. So for those people that are very healthy and and maybe can withstand with their immune system, um, having a virus like this and, and, and surviving it, um, maybe going into uh, somewhere where there's a bunch of other people that are sick is not the best idea. I think the best advice I'm seeing is reach out to a physician or a, a hotline where they can talk to you remotely. Um, where you're not being put in an ambulance with firefighters and paramedics who are possibly getting exposed. So we've actually seen uh, our call volume go down a little bit, you know, because we're not seeing as many vehicle accidents with less traffic. Um, people aren't out hiking and spraining their ankles as much. So we are seeing those type of calls go down, but the shortness of breath and flu-like symptom calls um, are obviously pretty high right now with everybody on edge. And if there is a means for you to be seen remotely, um, like some of the options that are out there, that's probably a better way than bringing four firefighters and two paramedics into your home, um, you know, and, and in an ambulance and everything like that. So just be smart, understand, you know, if it's an emergency, it's an emergency. And that's what we're there for. We will show up 100% of the time. We always have. But there are different ways that you can kind of um, handle, you know, your situation if it is not a life-threatening emergency. Yeah, one of the one of the takeaways is is don't panic and don't be stupid. Don't do stupid things, and uh, I think we'll all get through this. So, uh, common sense. Yeah, common sense goes a long way uh, these days, and <laughs> I would I would probably argue that there's a lot of uh, lack of that in our in our uh, world today. So, um, anyways, uh, Matt, thank you for coming on the show. Um, you can follow uh, Matt at uh, facebook.com slash savage UTV, Instagram.com slash savage UTV. Uh, I don't know if you're on any other platforms. We, we just uh, started working on our YouTube channel. We, we have a few videos on there that we just kind of put out because we understand people are at home. You're right. They're, they're, they're cooped up. They want something to kind of get their mind off of everything that's going on. And we thought, why, why not film some videos? So they're not the best videos out there because we did them ourselves, but they're, they get product information. They have some entertainment value. So check out our YouTube channel. It is Savage UTV. Um, and we will continue to, as new products come out, 
put those on there as we do trips and we do uh, fun events with our, our our adventure UTV. We will be filming videos and we'll upload it all onto there. So you'll be able to get all kinds of content. Right. So uh, if you can't find him right away, you can go to our YouTube channel. He's on the right hand side under um, our 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 partners. Uh, there's a link there to his YouTube page. Uh, go give him uh, a like and a, and a share or whatever you're going to do. Um, leave him a comment. Tell him how how you think of his products. Um, and uh, yeah, be a part of the conversation. Uh Add yourself to the dialogue on the on the social pages, um, and if you're in the in the market for uh, a belt case, I mean he's the only one out there. So uh, go <laughs> go grab one from his website. You can get one with the toolkit, one with the med kit. Um, there's also uh, the new products coming out, like you said, with the Pro Eagle uh, case. If you already have one of those, uh, he has the Trinity belts on his website. He mentioned that he has um, you know some other uh, goods coming on to the website if you're in the, in the market for those things. So um, hit him up, check out his website websites and uh go enter the the giveaway the sweepstakes we have for the savage utv case and uh along with the case uh we're gonna also do a, a, another 10 entries or uh, um, winners for uh, some swag bags so we'll send you some goodies from savage utv from us and some maybe some other vendors that have some stuff laying around over here so um yeah, go enter. Uh, again, side by side guys dot link slash savage. Uh, you can also go watch the video review or the written review of the Savage UTV case on our website, side by side guys dot com. And uh, yeah, uh, Matt, really appreciate the time. I know you just uh, came off a long stint at work, and I know you're probably looking forward to a nice nap uh, <laughs> through this afternoon. Um, but uh, yeah, just again, thanks for doing this, coming on the podcast, and we hope the community uh, got a lot out of this. I, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to have me on. And uh, and even more than that, I appreciate the review. Um, it's nice to see individuals in the industry that are that are well versed and experienced in these vehicles and, and, and can really not only tell you what they like about the product, but but to your face, tell you, hey, you know, this would be a little better. This would be I love getting feedback like that. So I can tell uh, the individuals that say that they review our product and, and, and they kind of like you know, do a quick little review. Um, you guys have gone above and beyond uh, with with how you've you've uh, taken the time to look at this and and bring it to your customers or my customers and and your viewers. Um, so I really appreciate that. It's uh, it's been great to to see you guys uh, <laughs> beating the crap out of it. <laughs> Yeah, well, we appreciate it. Uh, the The opportunity is what we're looking for. We we have a passion for the sport. We have a passion for these vehicles. Um, we're both, you know, tactical Timmies, as as Ian would say, um, and we love getting in our hands on uh, on on accessories and things that make the experience just that much better. So, um, yeah, hope you all the success and best of luck. And uh, I forgot to mention we have two full throttle batteries in the in the pre runner. I totally forgot. Whoa. All right. Send me a picture. We'll put it up on our Instagram. <laughs> For sure. we, we, did, we did a great uh, dual battery system that's custom mounted in there. And uh, really, it was the, the battery to go with just because of the performance and the size. And um, and I totally, totally forgot. Obviously, I, I didn't want to throw them in with the people who have... <laughs> you know, sponsored, but, but I, I was like, Oh, I got to mention it. And I totally forgot. <laughs> I, I, I didn't want to put you on the spot there, but, uh, I, I know you just put a smile on Ian's face. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're great, great batteries. They're great, great batteries. So, uh, again, thanks for being on the episode. Thank you. Take care, Matt. Until next time, everybody. Peace. Peace.